Thank you very much, Natasha. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I welcome you all to this free webinar and guest Thank lecture you. on International like World Cancer you. Day, organized by IAO, Suleiman, International Suleiman, Association of Oncology, and Scientific Day Partner BioLeads Worldwide. In Church about Center, our scientific Oxford partner, hospitals, NHS, as a nonprofit. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. My apologies. I welcome you all again to this free webinar and guest lecture on World yeah. Cancer Day. I see it. Organized by the International Association of Oncology and Scientific Partner BioLeaks yeah. Worldwide. A little bit about the, the BioLeaks Worldwide. This is a nonprofit and is globally recognized professional association that operates under the Technorit Group. It serves to propel and fuel all innovative works of research with immense potential in the fields of healthcare, life sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, and the medical in general. In this capacity, BioLeaks Worldwide has been directly responsible for a scientific significant amount yes, sir, of the revolutionary fine. developments that have taken place in these fields over the past few of the past few decades. About our organizers, International Association of Oncology is one of the world's leading professional associations for medical oncology and life science professionals caring for people. IAO is a non-profitable professional association meant for research, meant for research and development in the field of medical oncology and life science. IAO is an international forum for researchers, academicians, doctors, and practitioners for sharing knowledge and innovation in the field of healthcare and life sciences. IAO aims to bring together worldwide researchers and professionals, encourage intellectual development, and providing opportunities for networking and collaboration. IAO meets with its objectives through academic networking, meetings, conferences, projects, research publications, academic awards, and scholarship. IAO strives to enrich from its diverse group of advisory members. IAO brings together medical oncologists life scientists, medical practitioners, and researchers to advance the application of medical oncology to the public. IAO delivers access to its members, the industry's most essential te technical information by organizing conferences, workshops, annual convention, meetings, and provides networking opportunities both locally and globally. Members have the ability to stay current in their chosen profession, connect with peers, and invest in their future. IAO provides a broad-based home for members and societies who are interested in aspects of the medical oncology and life sciences, together with companies, hospitals, government organizations, pharmaceutical company researchers, and university researchers. Now I would like to welcome our honorable dignitary. First, I would like to welcome Mr. Siddhartha Jain, Managing Director of Technorit Groups, India. Welcome, sir. Good evening. Good evening. On behalf of International Association of Oncology and Technoral Groups, it is great pleasure indeed for me to welcome Dr. Gansham Bishwas, President of IAO, Dr. Ravi Patnayak, Professor Dr. Tejinder Kataria, Delegates and Executive Committee members from IAO and all over the participant of this Awareness Guest Lecture on World Cancer Day 2022 organized by International Association of Oncology. 
the major objective of io is to create cancer awareness and bring together the doctors professionals patients to get involved and connection with the best practitioner towards the whole world of organizing guest lectures international conferences workshop awareness camp and scientific events world cancer day is an international day marked on february 4th to raise cancer awareness and support cancer prevention detection and treatment the major purpose of world cancer day is to significantly uh, reduce uh, cancer related illness and death and it is serves as a rallying point of the international community to stop the injustice of cancer related suffering the theme of world cancer day from the year 2022 to 2022 for uh, is close the care gap on this world cancer day we recognize the power of knowledge we know that every single one of us has the ability to make a difference large or small and that together we can make real progress in reducing the global impact of cancer the people who suffer from this painful disease are something ignored by their loved ones because sometimes other people think that disease person can also be harmful for others but it is not good practice the suffering person needs the care and love of others to recover from this disease chemotherapy is a very painful procedure so the suffering individual needs support and love so that he can develop will power to fight with this disease on world cancer day event and walk are arranged to raise awareness about this disease and how to prevent one when people knows about the cause symptoms and treatment then they they can be better handle the disease uh, every individual action has the potential to make difference for ourselves the people we love and the world it times to make a personal commitment world cancer day is a time for the world community to stand against cancer let it not stand against you world cancer day is the day of determination open heartedly welcome the cancer victim to be returned towards life make them again the part of community not by just wearing lavender ribbons as a demonstration just practically soothing uh, them like the lavender plant itself soothes the pain the pain that kills a victim is not a disease of cancer itself but the isolation and separation from society on the world cancer day 2022 let us promise that cancer will not more kill our dear ones quickly and silently our determination and commitment will compel cancer to run far away from us once again i welcome you all thank you thank you so much sir Next, I would like to welcome our IAO president, Dr. Ganesham Biswas. He is currently working as an executive director on Sparsh Hospital, Bhubaneswar, Odisha, India. Good evening, sir. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody is doing fine. Good evening, sir. Sir? Hello? Yes, welcome, sir. Good evening. Here, so are you proceeding? Ah, okay, Rudra. one moment, please. Rudra? 
कंचन यस सर वन मिनट स्टार्ट नो अरे एनी प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज देर इज बैड नेटवर्क हेयर सो आई डोंट नो सो वेन थिंग्स विल गेट स्टक नो With much difficulty, I have joined actually. Okay, okay. So you can proceed for next. Siddhartha then, Rudra. Yes, Siddhartha. Yes. 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 My talk is finished, sir. You can can you can continue, sir. Yeah. So so let somebody somebody present. No, the slides. Slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Slide is. Is it, is it still there is a lot of confusion. Yes, it is visible. Can I get the first slide? Can I get the first slide? Can you display the first slide? Jojo, can you please share the slide? Okay. Sir, please start, sir. Me yet to see the slide. The slides has not been presented yet. How do I start? Sir, it's visible, sir. It's not visible to me. Because so we can started. see your slide. But I am not able to see. We can able to see your slide, sir. For me, it is like Kanchan has started screen sharing. Yeah, it will come. It will come. Maybe there is a lag. Yeah. Network error, sir. I Ravi, actually, I, I have, I, I just to Mumbai, and uh, maybe so in the hotel. Okay. Sir, your screen is visible. It's not visible to me. To me, it's like Kanchan has started scaring. You want to rejoin again, Biswas? Let me do that. Go ahead, sir, please. Yes, yeah, he's there now. Go ahead. Just let me know if you want the next slide, just say next. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry for the delay. Contact setting. No, it is Yeah, next, 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 next. 
go to the next slide Is this the slide, sir? Yeah. Hello? Doctor, is this correct? Hello? Doctor, is this correct? So somebody is muting me here. So, so this is the Global Global Can 2020 update. So from moving from 2002 to 2020, in these 18 years, you look so almost doubling the incidence from 10 to 20. And in spite of all advances, so there is a 10 million cancer death next next sir yes but, is breaking sir can you go to the next slide please so, so this is the so kanchan so go go ahead with the speakers no so i have an issue internet is here no please go ahead with the you know, Dr. Ravi Shekhar Patnaik's talk. Uh, Kanchan, can I share my screen? You have to stop. Yes, sir. One minute, sir. Uh, Kanchan, you can share, is it? The new PPT. Some problem. Some problem from my end. Okay, sir. One minute, sir. Is it visible, sir? Uh, no. Is it visible now? No, I can only see. Oh, yeah, it's coming. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm Dr. Ravi. Uh, thank you, uh, Biswas. Uh, thanks, uh, the IO team. Uh, uh, 
Siddharth, uh, the whole of the team who uh, could pick it up a good date to discuss on the cancer care. Uh, today being, uh, am I audible? Okay, everyone. Yes, fine, sir. Yeah. Yes, you so, are, the uh, doctor. I'm a consultant medical oncologist at TBCC, uh, the Cancer Center Brunei. Uh, Biswas was a good friend of mine. On behalf of still... IAO and IDA, I heartily thank you. Okay, so uh, now uh, why is February 4 uh, so important for us? People have been taking as, uh, you know, a breast cancer day, breast cancer month, pink month, uh, Movember being prostate cancer month. Uh, everywhere we go on talking about particular months to uh, cancer and other things. But down the lane in 2020, people all around the world, they met around in Paris and then they uh, found that it's just not um, doing research or uh, having new medicines or uh, uh, building up new centers would uh, actually help uh, giving the cancer care those who really need we have to understand this particular line. The line is cancer care to be disseminated to people who really need, uh, basically need the cancer care. Not that uh, you are building up a big centers in uh, metros, big centers in bigger centers, but that's not the place where we are looking at the most of the cancers are. So most of the cancer, if you look at, actually occurs in uh, poorer community and most of, if you look at in India, if you see most of uh, the population is in villages or, or maybe a second uh, strong cities where still we do not get proper uh, cancer care or the uh, hospitals or the radiation machines or whatever we can say. So, so they've found it out that all over the world, it is not just uh, doing researches would help. So the need to mobilize the whole of the community, which includes the doctors, the researchers, the patients, the caregivers, the government, everyone to adopt something what we call as to improve the patient services, raise awareness and mobilize global community to include adoption of World Cancer Day as February 4th, 2020. Can I have the next slide? Next slide, please. So, as Siddharth was saying, the theme for 2022-24, there have been three years which we have looking at. 2022, the theme is close the care gap. So what is care gap here? What we are trying to look at. We are not looking at bringing equality. We are, we are looking at closing inequities. So what is inequity we talk later so basically, inequity is the one which causes cancer care costs life. So people do not get proper care. Those who need uh, cancer treatment, they cannot get, maybe because of uh, economic, may, maybe because of uh, country where they are, maybe because uh, the race which they are. Yeah. So all these attribute or the you can look at the gender, maybe a male, female, there is a disparity. There is a male, female, transgender disparity. So all these can uh, cause a gap in the cancer care. So this year, we are going to look at steps to change this barrier. That's why this is what we called as close the cancer gap this year. 2023 would be something where we all unite and take an action, voice our opinion. That's 2023. And 2024, we challenge the government. We, we, we challenge the government if they are not coming up or doing something for uh, the people who really need the services, cancer services. Next slide, please. So why is, uh, sorry, back, back. So why is uh, cancer is the topic which we have to discuss? As Biswas has already shown you that how we have been increasing in the incidence of cancer. So we are looking at 10 million cancer deaths each year. And by 2030, we are expecting some 13 million projected cancer death. This is a projection which we are looking at. So if you look at combining all the infectious disease, TB, HIV, all included, still cancer comes as number one as a cause of death. 
And if you look at more than 65% of the cancer death occurs in low income countries. So that's quite, uh, quite a lot. If you look at, uh, if we look at the WHO's country specificities or the high income group, high middle income group, low income group, we see that most of the countries are in the low income group and most of the cancer occurs in the low income group and most of the cancer uh, deaths also occur in the low income group. So we are looking at uh, that 65% of the cancer deaths occurring in low income. That's why we have to unite through. Now it doesn't mean that high income group don't have cancer deaths. High income group do have cancer death. They do have inequities. I mean, like I have worked in India, I have worked in Brunei, I can see the differences which happens. So it's not about the equality, it is about the inequities. That means even in a high income group, there are conditions or norms which may, even if the cancer care is there, even if there is a lot of money for the services, still it may not go to the needy. That means like, let's say uh, the indigenous population of a high income group country, they may not be treated the same as someone from a white population or a, uh, or a majority population of that country. So there is a, the death actually is different in both the groups between the white and the black or between uh, the indigenous people and then the, uh, actually the, the so-called other majority people. The same, it can happen between a female and a male, even in a high income group. The same can happen between a transgender population having a cancer because of lack of, you know, uh, understanding of the nature of the disease or people not being empathetic towards each other. So we can say that uh, inequities doesn't only happen in uh, low income. group; It can happen in rich people also. So and the good thing is 30 percent of this cancer can be preventable. So I saw by chance Biswas was actually projecting one of the slides where he was discussing about tobacco, alcohol, and other things. So I will come to that. So most of the time we can see that 30% of the cancer can be prevented. Many times you happen to be in a clinic and people come, why me? Or then when you discuss with them, either they would have been a smoker, ex-smoker, or would have been uh, having some kind of an infections for which they have not been vaccinated or treated, all these. And also we look at the working conditions, all these are part of the prevention. So, and if we look at why this is also important for economics, on an economic point, total annual economic cost of cancer care is $1.16 trillion US dollars. So that's a huge amount. If you look at possibly the GDPs of many countries or the, the total economics of the country would be a, totally be a whole world's cancer care. So a country may be completely devastated if uh, they don't have a good cancer care and with the rising cost, rising treatment and with the new modalities of treatment, the disparity has been palpable. It's the same way as we say that in Mumbai is a city of disparities. Someone can be driving a Ferrari and someone can be still be uh, waiting for a first meal of a day. Uh, you can have an Antila, you can have a Dharavi. So this kind of disparity is still there in cancer. And it is not only limited to India, it can be limited to any of the countries, whether it is Bangladesh, whether it is Philippines, whether it is Pakistan, whether it is US. The rich are growing rich, the poor are still poor, but the cancer cost is still getting costly and dreary every day with new drugs, new instruments, new technologies, which I, my, my esteemed colleague next will be speaking about the radiation and others. You would find that the newer treatments uh, which have been there is not also a, a pocket friendly. So we have to find somewhere down the lane where we can treat uh, build this disparity, get it uh, down to minimal. I wouldn't say that nobody wants a profit. Everyone wants a profit. But still, we want to bring down this disparity, this huge disparity. And trust me, if we, we were never taught about preventive oncology uh, when we were being taught uh, during our training period, uh, same can be called by Biswas. When we were trained some 10, 15 years back, nobody taught us about 
about preventive oncology. So the most important thing is preventive oncology right now. It's not about doing research on new drugs, but tipping or nipping at the bud or finding out when the cancer has still not come into the limelight or not become stage one, stage two, stage three, because that's the phase when you can actually cure a disease. The treatment may be cheaper compared to when it becomes stage four. Next slide, please. Next slide. So as I said, 30% of the cancer can be prevented and tobacco is the hero of it. it it's actually attributes more than 22% of cancer death. You name any organ, it will be affected by cancer because of tobacco. So it can start from the mouth to the very end till the rectum. Every cancer is attributed somewhere to the use of tobacco in any form, whether it is a first hand, whether it is a second hand, and whether it is, you know, a lot of people say smokeless or vaping, all these are associated in all forms, is all associated uh, to cancer. And of course, tight uh, regulations and others have helped down to uh, reduce this risk and reduce this cancer death. I mean, like when I see here in uh, two countries, let us say China, which being a uh, lot of people being smokers, a lot of people being, uh, you know, uh, getting into the Western kind of a lifestyle, the Eastern Bloc of Europe, all these where the smoking is so prevalent, you see the lung cancer incidence is increasing. And countries which have curbed down, let's say US or the countries which uh, I can say Brunei, all these countries where there is a tight regulation to uh, tobacco smoking, there is a sharp decline in uh, lung cancer. So we, we know that tobacco is basically related to uh, one of the main uh, reasons or the main villain for uh, the cancer. The same thing now with the lifestyle modification, with people getting into more into Western lifestyle. I wouldn't say that Western culture is bad or Western food is bad, but it is about changing our lifestyle uh, to suit what we were not actually used to uh, going to a kind of a high oily refined food kind of a thing, sugar syrupy kind of a thing relating to obesity and other thing, which increases almost 12 different cancers are associated with it. Actually, if you look at in the Southeast Asia, Brunei being high income group countries become actually the bane, it becomes a bane for obesity. Actually, Brunei being number one and two in the Southeast Asia, uh, both in uh, pediatrics and in adults to, uh, for obesity. And obesity is the reason for a uh, lot of diseases, which includes cardiovascular disease, which includes uh, diabetes, which includes all, all these are also included with cancer. And people who have obesity are risk, having a lot of risk for the disease. And also uh, we are uh, looking at cutting down or having a physical exercise. All these prevents uh, getting into any kind of cancer. Alcohol, previously people used to say moderate drinking is okay. But the recent guidelines by the American Society of Oncology, they have all come to this conclusion that any amount of alcohol uh, has a risk of developing cancer. Whether in females, there is an increase in cancer because of the breast uh, cancer, if you look at, is also attributed to use of alcohol. So in any form, in any uh, people say that, okay, if I drink beer, we may not get, if we drink hard drink, then we may get. This is not actually true. Any form of alcohol is associated with some kind of cancer getting in. Infection. So in a low in, uh, income group countries, this is the bane which we say that uh, infection is the major cause of any kind of cancer, which includes cervical cancer, hepatocellular cancer, all these which, is, which can be prevented by uh, vaccination, screening. Uh, we know that hep for uh, hepatitis, HCC, hepatocellular cancer, the hepatitis B is the uh, reason and hepatitis C is the reason. Hepatitis B can be prevented by vaccinating. Same way for doing a proper, you know, uh, blood uh, screening and others, you can actually prevent uh, hepatitis C from uh, getting in. In the same way, we can say for cervical cancer, where you know that almost 80% of it is associated with HPV, and that can be prevented if we uh, vaccinate a girl child or the high-risk uh, group 
uh, if we keep vaccination uh, or give vaccination as a national formulary, then uh, you are preventing uh, cervical cancer. So infection is one of the reason. And we know that at one point of time, cervical cancer was number one cancer in India, which slowly uh, with uh, proper screening and the medications and vaccinations, it has come down, but the breast cancer has gone up. So it's more or less like some of the uh, things which we did not want did happen because of the breast cancer, because we changed our lifestyle. So we started to prevent one, but we landed up getting something else because uh, we changed our lifestyles to a Western kind of a culture, which led to the breast cancer coming into number one. So many of the country in the Southeast region, you will see that infection is the main reason for getting uh, cancer. So it's tobacco infection and obesity, which is, which in my view is the three main thing which we can actually inculcate uh, or teach from the school, uh, from the school kids onwards. These are the things which, if we can take care, then the prevention or risk of getting cancer can be actually minimized. Next slide. Next slide, please. So this is a in, sorry uh, back back. So this is a very interesting uh, notion which, uh, if you see the picture properly, you will see that this is a family which we are looking at. What is the difference between these two pictures? Now, the picture on my right side, if you say that I give uh, as a principle, uh, like a communism, an equal share to everyone, you see that not everyone is same. So if you give an equal care, you may not get equal results. So the care should be proportionate to who needs what and tailored according to the needs. The poor and needy may require a better services. That is where we come into this whole thing, inequity and an equality. So on the right, you see equality. So none, if you see the kid cannot see, although they both have been given the same platform, he cannot visualize the, uh, the nature. But if that the same kid has been given something more than others, he can actually translate it to see the whole beauty. So that is what the cancer care now looks at. We do not believe in equality in care. We believe in getting equity in care. Equity is what is more important for us now, not the equality. So that means in a country like, let us say in a low income group, the main thrust should be getting WHO's essential medicines into the formulary rather than getting a very high cost medications into the formulary where 80% of the people cannot afford it. So you are only treating those 20% of the people and 80% of the people cannot afford. So the same way, if we try to get generics, biosimilars into it, maybe you are in a situation to help those who really need to get that, those treatments. So this is where we have to look at. This is where we all have to come forward. This is where we have to talk with our NGOs, governments, and uh, you know uh, our other colleagues like pharma, pharma care and others. So this is a phase where we have to look at beyond ourselves. It is not about you, it is about all of us. And everyone is actually made in a different platform. So we have to give a different platform for everyone. Next slide, please. So uh, what is inequality and what is inequity in healthcare? Inequality is basically an uneven distribution of resources. Now, if you look at what is inequity, it is an unjust. It is not uneven, it is unjust. That means unjust avoidable differences in care or outcome, which may be related to where you are born, what your race is, and uh, what your gender is. So this actually uh, makes it a difference in cancer care. The theme now is we have to minimize this gap, this disparity which we have. So we have to cut out this inequity. This is what is more important for a proper cancer control in the world. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
So what are the key issues for a uh, cancer care? Equity is the most important, equity in access to cancer care. That means now I, I do not want to fight with uh, my esteemed colleagues, other colleagues who are working in a bigger centers. What we are looking at is we have to look at somewhere down those big centers to build up small satellite centers where they can actually give a minimal essential services to a general public. We do not want a very much and a kind of an hi-fi kind of a machine coming down to a, a village where you don't have a proper electricity and you try to say that we want to uh, give a proper cancer care here. So we have to look at where we can build up a situation. Let's say we are looking at a cobalt machine in a very small village, maybe more applicable than bringing some Linac machine in there. Or the same way you are going into a deep jungle where you want to give some kind of a treatment there. You have to look at what are the essential medicines which can be important and which can be done. And who are the people whom you want? You need to go for a mobile uh, mammograms. You want to go for an screening, your pap screening. If you are going to a village, you cannot go on saying that we want to do a CT scan for them. So you have to know what is more important for a basic care. So that, that is what we look at equity in the care. We are looking at prevention and risk reduction, which as I told you, there's some of the screenings which we have to look at, like the mammograms, like the uh, pap smear, like colorectal screening. These are the things which we have to look at, which can prevent. Making people aware and understand that cancer is not a death sentence. If you know them, if you try to find the uh, treatment uh, or diagnose the disease early, you can actually cure them. And now is a situation where we look at a lot of people, at least in this part of the world, a lot of people go into supplements. They don't, as I can hear from Siddharth when he said that chemotherapy is so painful. These kind of words can actually, sorry Siddharth, I have to take it, but I have to tell you that these kind of statements sometimes uh, is actually palpable in most of the people who think that chemotherapy is bad. It is not like that. We now with the standard care, with supportive care, supportive medications, with uh, you know newer medications, and the chemotherapy may not be that kind of toxic or things, and uh, unless you know about it. And when you make people aware that chemotherapy is actually not that bad if it can be managed and can be done by an you know, proper hands. The same can go with radiotherapy. People used to say that, oh, when you take radiotherapy, you turn out to be totally black, the whole thing, skin burns. Now you see that the newer machines, they hardly have any side effect. They hardly know about anything. So, and they minimize the toxicities they, they do as uh, the next speaker would be speaking. They would be giving a very pinpointed radiation to particular uh, sites, which hardly damages the uh, collateral. That's a very very little collateral damage. So we know that things have changed over a period of time. And we also want to look at government. We have to force government to look into this. Government should not only be specific to big cities. It has to come down to, uh, you know, tire three cities, tire four cities, and tire, you know, you know, villages where you really need, you need to uh, build up uh, medical centers, which, which people are trained to go down to at least treat this and reduce the bulk of uh, cases in the main centers, which actually uh, causes a lot of uh, disparity between two. I know when we were uh, getting trained in, uh, trained in All India Institute of Medical Science in Delhi, we used to see uh, in OPD some hundred odd cases and 80% of the cases would be either from Bihar or from Northeast or anything. None from Delhi would be uh, coming to that place, but most of the people are from other parts. So, you know, so all the way from Northeast, someone comes to Delhi in the December, you can understand the plight or someone comes from Bihar and comes to Delhi in December, how they have to. So that, that that's the disparity which we are looking at. So, it's good that now there are many uh, centers which are opening up in many of all India institutes are opening up in many of the cities in uh, India. So uh, it's like a branch. So now people can at least go to their own centers and get treated. That is a very good initiative of the government. So uh, this kind of approach should be there and we, we should uh, uh, 
uh, whole government responsible for that. And we also have to look at also that uh, it's not about only physical, which we are looking at. We also have to look at the mental and emotional impact. That means once a cancer has been diagnosed, the family suffers, the family suffers, the family suffers with it. And we also know that the, the finances support with it. The, the, uh, the whole community also has some kind of an effect on it. There is, you have to support them. 33% of uh, breast cancer patients are depressed. So this is studies which have been saying they suffer from something like a post-traumatic stress disorder. So they, we have to support them emotionally. It is not about just treating. It's not the oncologist will go and just write in some kind of medication. As an oncologist, we should support them. We sh as a caregiver, you should help them to tide over. The worst is, the most important thing which we know now is Patients who have been on treatment or who are on treatment or who got treated, their jobs, uh, they have been removed from the jobs. They are being told that you have cancer, so no more jobs for you. That is, that is not right. That gives them, you know, a kind of defeat. So we, we as a public should fight for their rights. They should be, they are like normal human beings. Does a patient who has diabetes is devoid of his services? No. Does a patient with hypertension is removed from a job? No. But if you see many of the cancer patients, the jobs are removed. They say that you have cancer, you are going to die. So you, you, no need, we don't want to employ you anymore. That is pathetic and that happens. So we, we do write letters, even in high income group uh, countries also, we used to write to their employers and saying that no, he's a curable disease, they can still work. So we have to look at all this, we have to fight for them. So the other thing which we are looking at, saving lives actually saves money. People laugh at it, but if you look at actually, if you go to the UICC site and read about it, you actually know that when you are actually saving one life, you are actually saving a lot many things. You, let's say, and an engineer or someone of a great repute is having a cancer. He has so many things to give back to this place or the country. Now, if he suffers from cancer and you lose him, or he is not working, or he is devoid of job, so how much of his his expertise is lost? How much government is spending on the care? All these, if you look at, actually there is a lot of loss. So preventive oncology saves lives and also saves money reducing skill gaps. What it means is, it is not that the best of the people should only be in the biggest centers. What happens to people who are in down the line? That doesn't mean that, okay, you might ask, you also left this, you also did this. What we are looking at is, we have to build up the second uh, you know, rung, the third rung. We have to support, we have to teach the nursing. We have to teach the curriculum in the med MBBS. I do know that when I was doing my MD medicine, cancer was like a last uh, line for none of my medical uh, teachers or medicine teachers would say that, okay, the patient is diagnosed of cancer in the round. Okay, send him back home. He doesn't have money. He will not do anything. You just, this is kind of an attitude which was there. And that's when I, when I went to uh, All India Institute, lucky that I got the great teachers who would fight for a penny for everything to uh, treat those patients, then we could know that what is the value of it. When I came back to Bhuvneshwar and Biswas was also there, we were only two people at the time in 2006, seven, I think, and for three years or so. Now we see that we have more than 10 medical oncologists there. So the amount has been increasing, but does it go back to the second level cities, third level cities, or the other cities? No. So so why it is no? Because there are no other uh, centers or the government has to build up those kind of centers where people can go back. When I was there, we didn't have any cancer centers. So we were just going on with one private center or that center. We didn't have any government centers to work for. So now you see there is, uh, in my place, like let's say in Bhuvanesha, now we have government institutes, there are cancer centers, so people can work. So this is what we are looking at. So raising... Uh, you know, uh, reducing the skill gaps is a very uh, important thing and uh, which actually reduces that disparity and working together as one is most important. We should not think that oncology is only between the oncologist and the patient. Oncology care is not that. Oncology care is the patient, is the main, main 
person which we are looking at it revolves around the clinician it revolves around the caregivers it revolves around the pharmacy it revolves around the nurses it revolves around the pharma companies it revolves around all the colleagues ngos and like said like now you are organizing this kind of a meeting you see that how you are also involved in it so this is how things are slowly over a period of time people are coming out in virtual platforms we are now seeing in youtube you are now seeing in facebook live you are now seeing in uh, instagram you are seeing in twitter everywhere we are looking at the world cancer day has been bombarded everywhere every virtual for format you are finding it this is how people start recognizing you now if you see this meeting which we are looking at i hardly can count that maybe we might be only 10 doctors but 90% are not doctors so that is so important so many of them are uh, trying to imbibe that what is actually important so working together is the most important thing which we are looking at uh, next please next so how do we reduce the inequity so collectively that means all of us together can reduce it by educating the public about cancer prevention prevention is the most important thing which we have to look at equipping healthcare professional with skills and knowledge including about how inequity influences cancer care yes that is most important we are not uh, someone who uh, you know know everything about it you can say that okay this is how you have been treating this is where we have to look at these are the people whom we should bridge the gap between them strengthening the primary health care delivered in communities that is most important our primary health care has never been good it is always uh, the tertiary health care which has been super good and people cannot go to tertiary health care everywhere so we have to build up the primary health care which is most important in most of the countries it is same for maybe same for bangladesh maybe the same for pakistan maybe the same for nepal maybe same for uh, you know uh, india everywhere or any other it is only the big cities which uh, has the best of the centers where the patient their their catering is 20% 80% of the people stay in villages and others where they don't have a basic health services so we have to look at and build up the, those primary health care which is a government a uh, kind of a thing which we have to look at increasing the resources meaning both money and people dedicated to cancer research that means now researchers sometimes feel that we don't get enough uh, you know financial uh, support so that's where it all happens uh, the same way we are looking at country specific so it is most of the time people think that we are looking at let's say what us has done what europe has done we follow them sorry we are not that us or europe may have uh, breast cancer as their main problem but in countries like us maybe breast cancer is not the first one which we have to look at it is more important is a cervical cancer the more important is other uh, infective diseases which we have to look at so this is what we have to uh, look at our prevention should be more specific to country so that is how inequity can be uh, decreased so that's how i look at how we can reduce inequity next now uh, closing the final thing i would say that how the cervical cancer why actually who uh, and world cancer this thing is eliminating cervical cancer from the world and many countries have actually almost uh, touched upon uh, eradicating it like countries like australia have almost 100% they have uh, an hpv vaccination so and trust me a lot of people say that it is difficult in india now when we can uh, boast that india 1.3 billion or 4 billion people could be vaccinated for covid vaccine our population for cervical cancer risk group may not be 1.5 billion so we could actually two doses of cervical cancer vaccine could easily be given so for all the those risk population so at if we think or the government actually makes it actually uh, uh, you know uh, urgent plan that we have to vaccinate and safeguard and remove the cervical cancer we could have and we could win this war against cervical cancer we have one against polio 
we have won against many of other diseases. Why not cervical cancer? Why cervical cancer is still looked out as some kind of a disease of the poor, disease of the poor, poor government cannot do anything. If you look at 600,000 new cases every year, that's worldwide, and 300,000 deaths every year. That's quite a lot if you look at. And every one minute, one new case diagnosed worldwide. And every two minutes, one death because of cervical cancer. And to, as I said, 90% of those deaths occur in low-income group. Because of lack of, you can put it, neither they would have been vaccinated, neither they could have been ever done a pap smear, neither they would have facilities of primary care, neither they would have a facility for treatment, surgery, radiotherapy. That's why we have almost this kind of death, which we are looking at. So, and it is one of the leading cause for cancer death in 40 countries all over the world. So, and it is a disease which can be eradicated. So HPV vaccination screening is the mainstay to eliminate the cervical cancer. Uh, so on this day, on this World Cancer Day, let us pledge that uh, one word which should hit us, close the cancer gap, one word which you should always remember, inequity. Please fight for, it is not just like uh, fight for equality. For cancer care, it is fight for inequity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you so much to our keynote speaker, Dr. Ravi Sikar Patnai. If you want to reach out with him, he is currently a consultant medical oncologist in TBCC, PJSC, Gerardong Negara, Brunei, Darussalam. Thank you so much once again, doctor. Next, I would like to welcome our next keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Tijinder Kataria Niseti. She is currently working as a chairperson in the Danza Cancer Institute, Gurugram, Haryana, India. Good evening, doctor. Good evening to you, uh, Ms. Mihoy, and I am grateful to in International Association of Oncologists as well as the IAEA for giving me this platform today. And I'm uh, following Dr. Ravi Patnaik's talk where he very well elaborated the inequities and the inequalities in the cancer care, which are available across the globe, as well as uh, how we can overcome them. So my talk is more uh, you know, dedicated or directed to the percentage of patients who do come to the hospitals take their treatments even when they are in early stages and then unfortunately fail. So can I share my screen, please? Yes, doctor, go ahead, please. Can you see that? Yeah, ma'am. Yes, we can now see your slide. Please, there you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll be talking about stereotactic body radiotherapy for oligometastatic cancer. So it's not only is the cancer death sentence, the cancer that's taken away with the treatment but comes back again is it sounds like a death sentence to the patient because it says that the patient has probably a metastasis and will not be able to survive. The national health policy in 2019 in India set out to reduce the premature deaths due to non-communicable diseases like heart attack, cancer, diabetes, or COPD by 25% by 2025 in alignment with the WHO sustainable goal development. And today on 2022, 4th February, World Cancer Day, as an extension, it could be to pledge to close the care gap and try to reduce the death rate by 25% for oligometastatic disease using stereotactic body radiation or what is known as stereotactic ablative body radiation with or without the assistance of body's immunity, immunotherapy or targeted drugs. So the salient points that I'll be addressing today is to define what is oligometastatic disease, what is stereotactic body radiation, how does the stereotactic body radiation work for oligometastatic disease, a few 
practical examples, summary and take home message. So it was in 1995 that Hellman and Weichelbaum yeah, yeah. presented their data to the Association of Clinical Oncologists at a platform and then published the data in, and the hypothesis in 1995 in Journal of Clinical Oncology, where the hypothesis argue, argues that the cancer comprises of a biological spectrum extending from a disease which remains localized to one and that is systemic when first detectable with many intermediate states. And this is a diagrammatic representation of the same, that there is a localized disease where we can hope for cure. And Dr. Patnaik addressed to the state before this early detection, he didn't talk, but prevention, we don't get into this. But once the patient is in this area and non-metastatic, then cure is possible. But then the patient may come in with either initially a metast oligometastatic disease, which has a limited metastatic capacity or widespread systemic disease which is a full polymetastatic disease. So I, we are going to talk about this here, whether and how to treat this. So in the eighth edition of TNM classification, it was found that synchronous single ex, extra thoracic metastatic site has been renamed as M1B. And the prognosis is the same as if the cancer was in one lung and in the other uh, lung and M1A. So the factors that led to this identification were that there have been improvement in diagnostic tools and imaging. There has been an increase in the systemic therapy choices for metastatic disease. And there are favorable outcomes over the last 20 years with local ablative therapies, including surgery. And this is a small overview about the non-small cell lung cancer, which was presented in 2021 by Gobini et al. on analyzing 31 studies where it was seen that in adenocarcinoma of the lung, 85% of the patients present with less than three metastatic sites. And Marklin et al. also showed in 2020 that in 2,250 patients with stage one to three breast cancer, distant failure occurred in 22% of patients, which was oligometastatic. That is very small amount of disease. And in a few sites, one, two, three, or one, two, five. And also we know that the prostate cancer in 20% of the patients may present with less than five metastases, which are either synchronous, that is at the time of start of the disease or subsequently in the course of the disease. So this is, a small uh, cartoon to show that this is what fractionated conventional fractional radiation is perceived as large fields. But stereotactic body radiation is the epitome or the top of the pyramid. And here it's very pinpoint targeted radiation with minimal collateral damage. So two beam, which is where I was trained 30 years ago, seven beams in 1999 to 2005, and today we are talking of stereotactic body radiation. Here, a very high dose of radiation is given such that it shuts down the blood supply to the tumor. It's directly killing the tumor cells. Even in the interface, the stromal support is irradiated and knocked down, and then there is an immune mediation. This is an Edigan study published in 2000 by Park et al, where they showed that if a dose of four gray, which is hyperfractionated given, then there is some cell progression or repopulation after four hours and eight hours, and then the apoptosis sets in. But when a high dose of 20 gray is given, there is a complete shutdown, and then there is no cell growth afterwards. So radiation, not only, although it's a high capacity when you have to start a department, but then it works over many years, 15 to 20, and make a different stage of the disease. I'm sorry, there's a lot of different things. Radiation 
directly kills the tumor and the products of the tumor are taken up by antigen presenting cells and given to the PDA cells, which are distributed and then can be every absolute So I'd like to just touch very briefly from a radiation oncologist's perspective as to what is the definition of an oligometastatic disease. So safe treatment delivery with a curative intent determines the maximum number. Although clinically accepted number is one to three or one to five metastases, where the total disease volume is less than five centimeters. And why should we be treating the oligometastatic disease with local therapy? The caveat is that it can delay the indication of start of re-chemotherapy and improve and maintain the patient's quality of life. It can control the symptoms of the patient, especially the osseous pain, and if there are neurological symptoms and there are more than one metastasis, then the patient can undergo this treatment without having had to recourse to surgery. And is it possible to cure this disease when there's already a metastasis? Let's take a look at the further discussion. So the initial studies were published as early as 2003 to 2007 and 2009, where isolated prioritic lymph nodes or lymph node recurrences from cervical cancer, prostate cancer, and colorectal cancers were seen to have responded to the high doses of stereotactic body radiation. These were anecdotal cases. However, in 2015, the Spanish society came up with the guidelines after reviewing 25 focus studies, and the guidelines were that if a patient has metastasis, not more than five centimeters in size or 17 cc's, but they're limited to three to five sites and all treated by a radical approach with the immobilization, which we have on the linear accelerators, and we follow the guidelines where we can treat these patients with image guidance. So this is a basic setup as of today. And if you are careful and you have a precision training, then this treatment can be meted out to your patients. So what is the evidence? And in Radiotherapy and Oncology Journal, the data was collected for over 400 18 lymph nodes treated in around 270 patients from 2008 to 2019. 21% of the patients were colorectal cancers and prostate cancer, about 18%. And it was found that the local control at one year after this treatment was over 87%. And at two years, 76%, which is symptomatic control and added to the quality of life of the patients. And this is a collation of the data in 2013 by Alison et al. And this is for the lymph nodes from different primary sites where the treatment resulted in an overall disease control or local control varying from 75% to almost 100%. And yes, this lasted not only over one year, but from two years to four years. So which is what Dr. Patnaik set out to say, that saving lives saves money. And a pooled analysis, systemic, systemic analysis published in 2021 showed that for 11 studies, two-year local control was over 80, 79%. And in another eight studies, the two-year progression-free survival was 53.9% alone with stereotactic body radiation. 
So this is published in 2013 again, uh, multiple metastatic sites from different cancers. And here again, we see the truth is holding on that we have an excellent local control from two to three years, varying from 66 to 88% with just three or five fractions of treatment to the patients, which reduces their stay, is not such a big financial burden, and is done on the linear accelerators which are already existing there. And almost in uh, some studies here also, we are seeing that there's a 100% local control varying from 18 months up to 52, per, 52 months, which is a very good result for the patients who have received this treatment. So does this translate into an overall survival? So this is a study published in 2016 by Julian Ribeira in lung cancer, where the local control after stereotactic body radiation for lung metastasis is over 120 months, standing at more than 60%, and overall survival at 24 months is almost 40%. Which other modality can give this kind of a result? In 1,422 patients with oligometastatic uh, disease treated in 17 national health centers in, uh, in the UK, 2021 study showed that overall survival for patients treated with ablative disease, ablative radiotherapy was 92% at one year and nearly 80% at two years with a good local control of 86.9% at one year and 72.3% at two years. So what happens with the stereotactic body radiation is that it, the dying tumor cell after being hit by the radiation and it leads to the production of the cytokines and the damage associated molecular proteins which are localized through the endoplasmic reticulum and then carried across the body besides the knocking out of the tumor cell. And this is where the lymphatics of the body work. The endoplasmic reticulum is located widely across the body and the tumor associated antigens and these inflammatory cytokines are recognized by the active and activate the dendritic cells and promoting the APCs, like I said, priming the T cells in the draining lymph nodes, which then enhance and come back to knock out more tumor cells. So tumor draining lymph node is an important pathway for robust epscopal effect and can be stimulated by radiotherapy. And it was earlier reported for melanomas, but now we are also seeing it happen in some other patients. And case in point is one of our own patients who was treated for a renal cell sarcoma way back in 2008 for a lung med, only with stereotactic body radiation, no chemotherapy and is alive today God's grace, she's doing well and has no other metastatic site. So this was a very interesting study published by Parma et al. And it was spread out over 10 centers, follow-up of 51 months. And ARM1 patients were distributed to standard of care versus ARM2 where standard of care was added to the stereotactic body ablation for uh, the metastatic site. And this was the distribution of the metastasis from breast, lung, colorectal, prostate. And five-year overall survival here reported was 17.7% in ARM1 versus 42.3% in ARM2, where the stereotactic body radiation had been added. And there was also an improvement in the progression-free survival in the patients who received stereotactic body radiation. So now the same group is looking at accruing two more studies where between one to three metastatic sites and four to 10 metastatic sites are offered stereotactic body radiation to improve the quality of life. They'll measure the toxicity, time to development of the new metastatic sites, the cost effectiveness, the progression-free survival, and these are the secondary endpoints. The primary endpoint is how does the overall survival benefit with the addition of a single modality of treatment across all types of cancer and across all body size with metastasis? So 
coming towards the end of the study, stereotactic body radiation results in a high local control of treated metastasis. About 20% of the patients are progression free at two to three years after stereotactic body radiation. The toxicity is low and it should be considered in patients with isolated metastasis, if, especially if the disease-free interval is longer than six months. We do need the randomized data to establish whether it improves the, only the progression-free survival or it adds to the overall survival. And how do the patients benefit? So how do we close the care gap here? Is that we give them, try, we are trying to give them a local a long disease-free interval and smaller metastases are the ones which are more amenable to this treatment. This is our own experience where we treated from 2013 to 2019, about 20 patients with 25 oligometastatic disease sites with a local control of 82% for a mean follow-up of 18 months. There can be unusual toxicities. So this is one of the gentlemen who developed a diaphragmatic paralysis after the stereotactic body radiation because the phrenic nerve was caught up within the tumor. So now we are started marking and treating all these areas with a constraint to the nerves, which we were already doing, but this was a very unusual case. So toxicities also need to be reported. These are few of our own treated cases with an adenoid cystic carcinoma metastatic to lung disappearing post-treatment and a patient with renal cell carcinoma with bilateral lung metastasis post-treatment three months with opening up of the airways, restoring the breathing uh, for the patient and making the patient comfortable. Then vertebral metastasis and pre-radiation, post-radiation. There is some uptake, but FDG value alone is not an ideal response in the resist, so persist criteria is now being used. Neuroendocrine tumor with liver metastasis, pre-treatment, post-treatment, various histologies do respond. And the best thing here is that you can sculpt the dose around the organs at risk. This is a spinal cord and the metastasis is being treated for hepatocellular carcinoma with a very, very sharp dose gradient so that you do not create a radiation myelopathy here. For head and neck cancers, one of the commonest cancers in our country can relapse with lymph node disease close to the carotids and stereotactic body radiation gives us excellent results. Mediastinal lymph nodes, again treated and disappearing post stereotactic radiation. Paratracheal lymph nodes, you would not try even to treat them with open beams because of the risk of esophageal injury, tracheal injury, or brachial plexus injury, but the dose gradients are so Then retroperitoneal lymph node metastasis over here, over here, close to the kidney, the kidneys are completely spared. Pelvic lymph nodes recurrence and treated with the intent of taking away the disease completely. We know that adenocarcinoma or small cell lung carcinoma can metastasize to adrenal and that also responds. Post-treatment, the size has gone down and subsequently chemotherapy, our colleagues working as one team take over and the patients can be cured. So this is where we see that when the tumor cells and the body immunity, they are in equilibrium, the disease may be under control. But if there is any untoward event or a clonal uh, repopulation or increase in the clonality of the tumor and escape, then the tumor goes out. So how do we eliminate is when we bring in the radiation as well as either chemo or targeted therapies. And stereotactic body radiation logistics are that it is an outpatient treatment, only 20 to 60 minutes, maybe an hour is required. 
Entire course of treatment is over in one to two weeks. No sedation. So it's almost like surgery without anesthesia. And the patient can return to activities immediately. So the advantage is that it's non-invasive treatment for multiple anatomic sites with high local control. It's cost effective. There's a high patient convenience and can overcome radio resistance. And we have to consider the radiobiology of the tumor when we give these treatments a perverted synergistic association with immunotherapy or as a vaccine is one of the effects which we are now observing. So after this talk, I would like to know, are you in this state of being curious? Are you bored or frustrated? But statutory warning is too much webinar listening can be harmful. I would like that you become curious and know, try to know how we can close the care gap for our cancer patients. And I'm grateful to my team. It's a teamwork to get across this tightrope work. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone would like to ask a question? I think wonderful talk by Dr. Kataria, I would say. Uh, as we as he touched on this uh, nicely on a other way around, that how we can cut the cancer gap, uh, cancer care gap, if you look at, uh, if you minimize the number of days they stay in hospital or come to the radiation department. Uh, uh, long back, people used to come for 25 uh, fractions or five weeks, six weeks, they used to stay. Now it's a matter of five days, they finish off the radiation. So that actually helps a lot. So, uh, so I think that's most important, uh, which uh, she touched upon. Uh, she also touched upon, I, I personally would uh, uh, actually uh, appreciate that what she showed all her experience over a period of time. She gave uh, SAPR, which is such a new modality as many of the people would not be knowing about it. But this uh, whole thing, either stage four, not all stage four are same, which is also so important that we have to understand that a one to three uh, sites of disease or particular histology, it gives a different outcome because many of the time people are not aware. All they think that stage four means death. So this is where uh, Dr. Kateria had shown that many of her patients have been surviving with that and uh, giving uh, such a um, you know pinpoint radiation over five days, three days kind of a thing, and people are happy to go back and work. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kateria. You're welcome, sir, and thank you for your kind comments. And uh, I think it's like we discussed, it's a teamwork. So taking on from your last three points, I decided that we should talk about how upscaling the skills, working as a team can save lives from uh, you know early prevention to cure. The whole spectrum needs to be looked at when we are looking at the cancer care on this World Cancer Day. Thank you once again, um, the International Association of Oncology and the IEA for creating this platform for discussion. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Ravi Patel. Thank you so much once again, doctor. And thank you so much for all our participants today. Now, before I proceed, I would like to request everyone to please open their cameras. I would like to take a group photo of all the members tonight. I'll request you to share the picture with us, please. Sure, no worries. Thank you.
right, everyone, I have five pages, so please bear with me. Hold your smiles, all right? All right. One, two, three, say cheese. Hold it, second page. One, two, three, say cheese. Hold it. Third page. One, two, three, say cheese. Hold it. I'm on the fourth page. One, two, three, say cheese. Hold it. And I'm on the last page. One, two, three, say cheese. Hold it. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'll be sharing the photos on the chat box. One moment. All right, all the photos are shared on your chat box. Please download each photo for all the pages that I took. And thank you so much, everyone. Now, um, Dr. Professor Tijindir Kataria Niseti, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. On behalf of IAO, I heartily thank all the delegates and students who have joined us today. Thank you all for participating in our webinar. Stay tuned with us for more updates regarding the IAO webinar and conferences. You can download your e-certificate on our IAO dashboard. Thank you so much once again. Good evening, everyone. Good Bye -bye. night. Thank you. Bye, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. I will leave the meeting for a few more minutes for you to download the photo and I will end it after 10 minutes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. This was the very wonderful session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.